You see what you get when you mess with the orphan. We were a low budget film. We shot all at nights, and there were about five other movies that were being made in New York that summer. And so uh, nobody wanted to work on our film. So crew-wise, it was very difficult for us to crew up. One of the first things that happened was that uh, we had to dismiss a first AD, and uh, we had to replace him. And we decided to bring in a first from L.A. Back at that time, it was considered that Los Angeles assistant directors could not do New York street pictures. The crew was too tough, the location shooting was too tough, everything was beyond what we could do. We were too busy eating tofu and beans to be able to handle the streets of New York. So I had to go out there and prove myself. The consequence of it all was that I was looking at it from a perspective of career success or survival. And uh, later on, I realized it was like the Odyssey. We would go in 5.30, 6 o'clock in the afternoon to the Gulf and Western building, you know, up by Columbus Circle in New York, get in a van, be driven out to wherever the location was in, you know, whether it was the Bronx or Brooklyn, wherever we were filming, film all night, be brought back to the Gulf and Western building, you know, we filmed until the sun came up, so you'd get back there, you know, 6 o'clock in the morning or whatever. I'd go home, eat, go to my apartment, usually wake up around 1, 1.30 have something to eat, and I would go to the gym. I was usually at the gym by 2.30 in the afternoon. So throughout that process of filming, I stayed in shape, and you know, and I know others had their regimens as well. We didn't realize how short the nights were in New York in the summer, and the fact that you had to have an hour lunch every night, which meant in reality you were losing an hour and a half in the middle of what was already a short night. One of the things I loved to do was find locations and set them up and get the permission and all those things. So as we were going along, Walter wanted to shoot in real areas. He, he didn't want to shoot on a sound stage. He wanted to shoot in the Bronx and he wanted to shoot in Queens and he wanted to shoot in Coney Island. So I had to have extensive meetings with, um, with the police department and their gang unit. And we determined where it was more safe to be and then we would go from there and then we would go look for the locations and try and find the most interesting visuals that we could. Walter did a very clever thing in the script, which is when they look at the subway map of New York and they point out where they are and where they have to get to. And the whole rest of the time in the movie is focused around getting onto the next subway that they need to get onto, which really drove the movie. One of the key links to the movie is the subway. So I also had to establish a relationship with the uh, transit authority uh, because we were either using a station all the time or riding on the subways, and, and that had to be done at night. All movie companies are forced to shoot at the Hoyt Skirmhorn station, which has a dead track, and you lay the train up at that side. You do the ins and outs of the train. The train pulls in and out. People get on and off. You do that there, and you take the train out on the road. We shot the conclave in Riverside Park, and it was very exciting. We all dressed in one or two trailers. That was it. We knew something special was happening, I think, you know. Well, it was our big money sequence in the movie. And it was unusual because usually you try to have your biggest sequence late in the movie, but we were kind of trapped by the notion of the story. It was very difficult to get everybody into the situation, you know, the, the amount of kids and get them into costume and again, the short nights. I, I think it's the sequence that cements the style of the movie. It not only states the problem of the movie, but as a matter of fact, it rather falsely demonstrates one premise and then the outcome of the sequence then really states the premise of the movie. One gang could run this city. Nothing would move without us allowing it to happen. We could tax the crime syndicates, the police, because we got the street suckers. Can you dig it? Yeah! My recollection is we had a thousand kids in the Riverside Park riot. 
and each one was a member of about 200 gangs. There were a lot of gangs, a lot of different colors. And there was a challenge to get these kids to listen. And I used what was called, what I call a God mic, where you put up a lot of speakers and amplifier and I have a microphone and it's the voice of God. I fill the room. So I can talk softly, communicate, but also keep it orderly. It, it was a wild, wild four or five nights. We had this wonderful actor who played uh, Cyrus, uh, who had replaced an actor that we cast who we could never find. He had, he, a real gang member, a real leader of a gang, who we cast, came in, and then when we went to put him in the part, nobody could find him, and who knows, I never, to this day, don't know what had happened to him, never heard from him again. So we cast another guy who was absolutely fabulous. Roger Hill, who played Cyrus, gave his speech, and he very theatrically climbed up on that jungle gym made of wood and started talking about our little piece of turf. I got goosebumps thinking about it. He was just wonderful. Our turf. Our little piece of turf. That's crap, brothers. Everybody cheering like that. They meant it. It was supremely exciting. He was so good and so charismatic that it actually started to seem almost believable for a minute. It's often imitated. Can you dig it? It was this great kind of faux messianic speech and uh, resonated forever. I was a stunt coordinator on the Warriors and uh, I couldn't find anyone to do that particular stunt. Walter wanted it, so they actually put the afro sheen in my hair and we uh, did the whole thing and I ended up, uh, unfortunately, doing that stunt. But the harder problem was staging a riot with people who never even, they didn't know what a lens was, they'd never been an extra. So I had to get these kids to perform on cue, stop on cue, and make it look like a riot without bumping in anybody. I took the first 50 kids and put them in a circle and ran them counterclockwise. Then I took the next 80 kids and put them in a larger circle and ran them clockwise. And I took the next 110 kids and put them in a larger circle and ran them counterclockwise. But nobody ever bumped into anybody. And they didn't have to learn anything except follow the guy in front of you. It, there's a moment in a movie where you, where you think, boy, if this comes out, this is something. And that, that was the moment because it was so colorful and so exciting and so real and yet surreal. Warriors are blamed. The gangs of New York unite. Opportunity lost, but they can unite on one thing, get the Warriors. So that became the statement of what the rest of the movie was going to be. Oh, shit. You all right? Yeah. I was very concerned of one element in our story, and that was that the story was to take place entirely in one night. I thought that it would be um, unreasonable to assume that we won't show up to location one night during the summer in New York and it wouldn't rain. Indeed, we had some pretty heavy rain at times. Now, my suggestion was that very early in the story we would introduce a New York City summer downpour. And the reason I wanted to have that scene is because that gave us the excuse to wet down the street in every take that followed this particular sequence so that we would have the benefit of the wet pavement reflecting all the lights and colors. And uh, I knew that that would not only add to the quality of the image, but also uh, uh, help uh, with the technical shortcomings. Added to these difficulties was the subway. Photographing in the subway, every element had a big asterisk next to it, and on the bottom of the page it said that the asterisk meant impossible. From my point of view, the difficulty once again came from the technical shortcomings at that time. The subway cars, for instance, had a certain type of fluorescent lighting built into it, 
part of the design of the car, so there was no such thing as turning them off and putting up my lights. What I decided to do was that, first of all, I borrowed some of the tubes from the transit authority and uh, my electrical crew made up very makeshift lights for fill and modeling within the car. But we couldn't really correct the areas outside of the car. New York City, for instance, as seen through the windows of the subway cars or the tunnels. And what we did, we just mixed it with so many other colors that the hodgepodge of lighting, in fact, became one of the strengths of the photography. It, it was unusual, it wasn't normal. Shit, this train's had it. Why couldn't it rain now? Come on. I had to go to the transit guy and say, why would a train stop? You know, these guys are on their way and usually nothing stops the subway. And he said, well, if there's a fire, they would stop. So we created this fire that would, in reality, stop the train so they had to get off because we were trying to find ways that they would have to engage another gang. When the warriors in their journey back to Coney Island come through the territory that is owned by the orphans, the character of Mercy subsequently really becomes part of our gang and our journey home. Uh, you know, that's her choice and we somehow, especially the character of Swan, tacitly agrees to that happening. I have to say, it's an incomparable position to be in. I, it was amazing. It was just me and a bunch of really cute, great guys, and they made me feel like a million bucks. Everybody did. Walter did, Frank did, and I was trying to dress one night, perhaps in the costume trailer, and all the extras were working that night, and somehow my space <laughs> disappeared. I had no place to be, because they were all dressing, and it was that evening, the guys said, come into our trailer. And from that moment on, that was my trailer too. And they were actually perfect gentlemen always. I don't remember a, an inappropriate moment ever. She had some bad luck, uh, we all did, when making the movie. She had broken her wrist and had to have the cast put on, and we shot around her for several weeks, then finally we ran out of work, and that's why the, uh, she suddenly appears wearing a coat there was never really much of a way to explain it. So we just brought her in and I put this coat on her and she announces that she stole it. Where'd you get the coat? I stole it. Cops are looking for somebody in a pink top. In the original screenplay, the character of Mercy and Fox become the love interest. The character of Swan has a different arc that he goes on. He's captured by another gang and held prisoner and eventually escapes from that incarceration and finds his way back in some subway place, meets up with some members of the gang, and then they have that final confrontation with the rogues. But I think part of that changed because there was an on-screen chemistry between Deborah and myself that everybody, Walter, Larry Gordon, the editors, whoever was watching that, just saw it happening. On movie, things do happen, and it became uh, somewhat obvious that the chemistry between Tom Waits, the Fox, and Deborah, that that chemistry wasn't happening, but the chemistry between her and Swan, the Michael Beck character, was happening, and it wasn't scripted that way. So it became then, well, what do we do? I mean, you know, how do we deal with that? And so they came up with the solution of the Fox is gonna get a fight with the cops, and he's gonna get thrown in front of the train. He and I weren't communicating very well. I've always felt badly about it. Uh, so finally, I figured out a way to eliminate his character. I think we shot Cyrus. Every gang in the city must be looking for us. Holy shit. You have the warriors and their journey home, which is not just going from one gang to the next, but they split up. They have their separate adventures. The script also adds the tension of scenes with the riffs who are chasing them. David Patrick Kelly as Luther, a great villain in scenes where he's tracking their progress. The, the warriors themselves are almost nerds at the beginning of, of the movie. You know, as opposed to the other gangs who are supposed to look really threatening, the other gangs have a lot more going for them than the warriors. 
The, the one gang that really has the energy, though, is the Baseball Furies. The moment they come on screen with this makeup and uh, grabbing their baseball bats, you know you're in, in another land. Maybe we better take off. Yeah, right. Holy shit.